Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Income, Growth, and Value Virtual Expo. Starting off our workshop this morning is going to be Jay Mintzmeyer, and he is the Head of Research Value at Investor's Edge. And with that, um, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box, and we will get to those at the end of his presentation. And with that, Jay, I'm right here if you need anything, and the floor is all yours. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining the Money Show Virtual Expo. I'm excited to get things kicked off here and, and share a little bit about the shipping markets. Uh, for those of you who do not know me yet, I am the founder and president of Value Investors Edge. We are a boutique research firm that focuses exclusively on maritime shipping. So you can follow me on, uh, used to be Twitter, on X at Mincemeyer for free. We also have an entry-level newsletter, and we have a full research platform as well. So just to kick things off, I've been working with Money Show about three years now. They're gracious enough to keep inviting me back for their uh, virtual expos. And each time I share three or four of our favorite picks across the sector, and I like to track the performance of those picks from each presentation to each presentation, uh, just to see how we've been doing. So uh, just going back about a year now, here's the last three times we uh, our team came up with picks and I presented at Money Show. And you can see... Um, Earlier this year, we, we had a 16% outperformance in four months. Then in January, we had a 24.5% outperformance in about in less than two months and seven weeks. We had one negative one um, in March. From March to September, we underperformed by 15%. And then last September, so it's only been two months since the last one, uh, we outperformed by 9%. And that's 9% in two months. So if you annualize that right to the power of six, that's like 100% annualized outperformance. So pretty happy with that. And then one quick uh, throwback very first money show. Um, I, I show this one because a lot of folks say, hey, Jay, we like what you do in shipping, but I can't invest in shipping. I can't hold it. I can't really invest into it and hold long term. It's not a buy and hold sector. Well, maybe it's not buy and hold if you don't have the right entry points, but it's a cyclical industry. And if you can find the right sort of lows and the right attractive price points, you can have some phenomenal returns. And here's an example of that. These are the five um, COVID recovery plays that I shared. This was on August 3rd, 2020, and it's it's on YouTube. Money Show's got the video. I got the video. Anyways, these were the five picks, and you could see the total returns. And, and not just the massive total returns, but also the huge dividends. I mean, if you look at every single one of these companies has paid huge amounts of dividends. Starbuck has paid more, almost 150% of their entire share price. Dorian's paid more than their entire share price. GSL is about equal to the share price. Flex, you get the point. Pretty huge dividends. And the average return was 352% in, in 39 months and, and, and versus the S&P 500, I mean, it's 10 times the return. So we're pretty proud of that. Uh, hopefully I've uh, illustrated that there's some nice returns in shipping. So today, look, we're, I'm going to talk about our company and our research approach for about five minutes here. We're going to talk about the overall macro market setup for about five minutes. And then I'm, for about 10 minutes, we're going to talk about shipping picks and, and the top industry. So we're going to talk about tankers, container ships, and dry bulk. And then the last 10 minutes should be a Q&A session. So if you have any questions as we go through this presentation, uh, please just type them into the chat and our moderator will collect those and we'll spend about the last 10 minutes or so taking those questions. So our lane, as I mentioned, is, ex is exclusively maritime shipping. We don't do anything outside of that. We do only what we, we have expertise in. And the reason we love this sector is because it's so niche and there's not a lot of publicly available research for this sector. So that opens up a lot of market mispricing and, and opportunities to take advantage of that. And not only is it, is it mispriced, it's a cyclical and leveraged industry. So you have a lot of ups and downs and a lot of chances to allocate between different types of positions. So our team is actually 11 total members. Um, the, the moderator had said that I was the head of research. That, that used to be true. Uh, Clement Mullins is now our head of shipping research. Um, I'm, I'm the founder slash president at this point. Uh, James Catlin, head of macro. Some of y'all might know him from Seeking Alpha. He's had some phenomenal articles out there. And here's some other team members that, that have recently joined us. I don't list all 11 because, you know, we have some back office guys, we have some interns, but uh, just a great team that's it's really supporting our work. And that great team, right, that's focused on such a niche sector has driven these sorts of returns. Uh, our annualized return over the last eight years is 43.3%, which is about 16x over the last eight years. And so that's about 10 times the return of the S&P 500 and about 30 times the return of the Russell over that same time period. And of course, uh, past performance does not dictate uh, future success, but I'm proud of our team's track record and very proud of our research and always staying in our lane. So with that said, we'll talk about the shipping market and some of the upcoming catalysts. 
Um, for those of you who are, who have been to some of these previous presentations, this is kind of review. Uh, but for those of us just joining, first of all, thanks for joining. Um, but this is just a brief background of what kind of happened to shipping over the last couple of years. So we had this huge crash during COVID. But ironically, during COVID, it was not the shipping rates that were falling. It wasn't the fundamentals. It was just fear. You know, investors thought, well, global recession upcoming, the last thing that I want to invest in is shipping. And, and I can understand that knee-jerk reaction, of course. And, and, and 2021 marked a sort of wake-up call as, fee, as people realized, wow, not only were cash flows strong, they were getting stronger. These companies are really recovering. The balance sheets are fine. And, and we had massive returns in 2021. That was our best year on record. Um, our long-only models, I mean, no leverage, no options, just stock, uh, we're up 133% in 2021. So that, that's the best year on record. Uh, hopefully I can do, do even half as good as that one more time. I mean, that was, that was such a great year. Um, 2022 uh, was also a really good year because it was a story of disruptions and dislocations. So if you were nimble and you were, and you were investing in the right segments, you also made a lot of money in 2022. And, and keep in mind, 2022 is when the market was falling back down, right? And so, you know, the Russell 2000 was negative in 2022. Um, our models were up 55% last year. And that was a story of dislocations. And now in 2023, we're shifting more into a story of, uh, of maturity, of cash flow harvesting. Uh, there's several companies which are now debt completely debt-free, which is like unheard of in this sector. Um, I've actually never seen a net debt-free company in shipping in my entire career. This year, we have two of them already, and we're poised to have four or five by Christmas or January. So that's, that's pretty phenomenal. And, and as I say at the bottom in the bold text there, the relative and selective equity valuations are still attractive. Now, there's a few companies that have gotten ahead of themselves, and, and we won't really be talking about those today, right? Well, I'm going to share three picks at the end of this, and all three of those picks, I believe, are extremely attractive in terms of their valuations, and all three of those picks have very strong balance sheets. In fact, all three have the strongest balance sheet they've ever had in company history, and these are companies which have 20-plus uh, year uh, track records. So in terms of the ongoing uh, macro tailwinds, we'll kind of start with the positives, and then I'll also talk about some of the risks. So the tailwinds, we have surging for cash flows and shareholder returns at most of these firms. Uh, the tanker markets we're going to talk about, they're poised for a potential super cycle. Um, I would say very high odds. You know, it's always potential, right? We don't want to, we don't like to throw around the word super cycle lightly, um, but very high odds of entering into that soon. Those balance sheets, as I mentioned, are the strongest in history. And we're going to see significant dividends, and from some of the laggards, right, the companies that are trading at discounts, we're going to see lots of repurchases from those companies. Secondly, we have a lot of upcoming environmental regulations, which are really going to slow down the fleet. And if you slow down the fleet, that's like a synthetic reduction in supply. So supply going down, demand going up, rates can go ballistic. And so we had a lot of regulations which started in January of 2023. But the first year was just kind of a data gathering diagnostic year. There wasn't any punitive measures or corrective actions required, but in 2024, there will be. And that's just six weeks away, folks. So this is really, really exciting for, for shipping investors. And I, I think it's kind of went under the radar. A, a year or two ago, lots of people were talking about this, but I think kind of 2023 came and went and there wasn't like a huge jump in rates or a big impact. And I think folks kind of just forgot about it or shrugged it off. But what I think a lot of people haven't realized is that 2023 was kind of the implementation year. And ever, all the actions, all the biting happens next year. And, and, and it's actually a five-year rolling period. 24 is kind of the first year, and then 25 is tougher, and 26 is even worse yet. So it's going to be a really exciting five-year, or four more years left of this five-year cycle. And then, of course, we also have this future propulsion technology and, and other regulations that are under discussion. By 2030, the regulations on shipping are going to be much, much higher. And a lot of folks, I, I think they say, well, the regulations why are you positive? Why are you bullish on regulations, Jay? Well, the reason for that is that these regulations will force out some of the older marginal fringe tonnage. And as we get into the tanker sector, I'll show you kind of the age profile of the fleet. And keep in mind that we're investing into the companies with the most modern ships and the strongest balance sheets. And when you have these regulations, you force out the marginal players, you force out the weak tonnage, and those who, who remain make even more profit. I mean, if you look at like, you know, big pharma and big oil and all these big companies, these big companies love regulations, right? Because it actually helps them. And so finally, um, the oil market's pretty tight right now. Um, 
OPEC plus has been super uh, supportive. I, I know we have sort of like demand questions and that's sort of one of the, one of the cautions as well is like, well, how strong is that global economy? But OPEC plus has been kind of holding back on their oil exports. And if OPEC ever increases their exports, which I believe they will kind of uh, taper down on some of those cuts by February or March, that could be very bullish for tanker markets. So those are kind of the catalyst and, and upcoming things we're looking at. And then of course, for the headwinds, because we always want to look at both, because we, we need to keep, keep this in mind too. First of all, the, the global economy and Chinese reopening has been pretty disappointing so far. And shipping performance really kind of correlates with global GDP growth. And, and, and that's been lackluster. Um, the U.S. has had strong GDP, but shipping's a little bit more focused, in fact, a lot more focused on the rest of the world and, and Asia in particular. And so here's a look at the last line there. We, we prefer the companies that have uh, longer term fixed contracts and they're less exposed to some of these uh, ups and downs. Uh, the, the exception to that would be the tanker markets where we do like spot exposure because the prospects are so strong. Secondly, Inflation is still biting. I mean, especially in, in some of the emerging market economies, it's bad enough here in the United States, but it's even worse in, in countries like Turkey and, and parts of Asia. So this is hurting consumer buying power and the central banks have, have, have taken it pretty seriously. Right? They, they've done all the interest rate hikes and, and such, but there's a concern that maybe they moved a little bit too far and, and there could be an overcorrection. I, I think it's too early to judge that, but, but I think it is a viable risk. And then finally, uh, disruption in shipping is usually a positive thing. I, I like to be really careful with my word choice because we don't want to see obviously conflict or, or anything like that, but disruptions are positive, but any sort of like full-blown war is obviously not a good thing for anybody. And so Ukraine's always been kind of a uh, source of nervousness uh, for me. I, I think things seem to have kind of simmered down a little bit in, in that region. But as I say that, we have escalating tensions in the Middle East. Right. And so the regional conflicts not really impacting the market at all. But if that gets out of hand, um, it could be it could be a negative, of course. And of course, that that's that goes without saying, of course, longer term, people talk about China and Taiwan and those tensions. So, so these are all things that the geopolitical uh, geopolitics are all things to consider as sort of a risk to shipping. I mean, I mean, short term disruptions like sanctions and things like that are positive, but but full blown like war is, is obviously not a good thing. So hopefully that's kind of a balanced view of, of sort of the positives and catalysts, as well as sort of the cautions for shipping. So with that said, we're, we're going to talk about the three segments here for the next 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to type those in. So for tankers, and I have a question mark here because I don't want to be 100% saying we're super cycle, but I believe we're at the ignition phase of, of, of an upcoming super cycle. Uh, these tankers got decimated after COVID. COVID knocked out so much demand. And at the same time, there's a huge stockpiling of oil, and most of it didn't need to be transported by tankers. Most of it was stockpiled in, in local and strategic inventories. So this was tankers did really terrible for about two years. But then the market started correcting, demand started improving, and then Russia invaded Ukraine. And for tankers, this was very supportive of the market because the sanctions caused huge amounts of trade rebounding. In fact, there was just a headline. It was yesterday, so I didn't even have time to get it into the slides. There's a headline that the U.S. Uh, sanctions office is looking into 100 different tankers, from 30 different owners into pot uh, potential sanctions violations. And I'm surprised the market hasn't reacted to this yet. because This is massively bullish news for, for tanker owners. If those tankers get taken away or restricted from the market, uh, we could even see rates go ballistic. So, so that's, that, that was a pretty important thing. It, the headline was just yesterday afternoon. Um, so tankers are, are very interesting. right now. Not only that, on sort of the demand and disruption side, the supply side is just absolutely beautiful. And I'm going to show some slides in a minute. On that. There's really very few deliveries upcoming from this quarter, right now, Q4 23, all the way through 2025. And so you have almost no supply coming online. So if demand is just halfway decent, rates are going to surge. And I believe we have the potential for a multi-year super cycle through 2026, maybe even 2027, because if those rates are really strong and owners are like, wow, I, well, we need to order new tonnage. Right? They're going to, because the market's always correct, right? When rates are really high, people order more ships. You cannot deliver a ship today until maybe Q2, Q3 of 2027. So that's just, that's just a very, very interesting thing about this segment. I think a lot of folks don't realize how long it can take to order one of these new vessels. So our top pick in tankers today, and it might be a little bit controversial to some because uh, they haven't been paying out as large of a dividend as some people might like. 
Uh, the management, some people don't like the governance structure. And, and, and that's fair. There's some quibbles to make there. Uh, but this company has a 20-year track record, and they're very well operationally managed. It's Zocco's Energy Navigation. And I have a long position in this company, as I do in, in many of the companies uh, we talk about. But that should be very clear and very disclosed. And, and some of the other tanker companies, I have them mentioned down there below. Um, one of the other ones that I'm long that I've mentioned before is Scorpio Tankers. Uh, but our top pick today is Zocco's Energy Navigation, TNP, and it trades around $22. Um, I believe it's worth about $30 to $40 today, but their um, net asset value, like if you just sold all their ships and, and take away the debt, is pushing $70 right now. So that, that $30 already has a huge discount. And so the people who say, well, I don't really like the governance structure, the family owns too many shares, um, there's not enough room for like minor, minority shareholders to vote. Um, I, I think our $30 target versus 60 to 70 nav kind of accounts for that, but that's that's a fair point. And I, I want to always be very transparent about some of the negative things and some of the things uh, other folks are saying. So in terms of, we, we talked about sanctions and how they impact trade flows. I'm just going to show this one slide here. It's from Scorpio Tankers, and it shows how the old uh, flows, and, and it's maybe a little bit harder to see here. I need like a laser pointer, but see some of these solid uh, blue lines here. These were the historical trade flows before Russia uh, invaded Ukraine. And then after that, all the diesel and a lot of it had to be rerouted. See the little dash lines here? And they're almost two to three times far away. And not only that, because Europe shunned, stiff-armed all of that Russian diesel, Russia had to import, or the rest of Europe had to import it from the United States, from the Middle East, from Asia. And so you see this, the massive reshuffling of these trade routes. So just the impact of, of that led to substantial demand increases. And with the United States cracking down even more on sanctions busters, uh, we, or sanctions violators, we might see even more uh, of this positive impact to the market. So even, even without demand growing, the actual demand for shipping, which is in ton miles, right, how far you're taking that cargo, might actually increase. I mentioned there's very few ships arriving until 2025. This chart is like nothing I've seen in my entire career. I mean, there is one VLCC. A VLCC is a very large crude carrier, carries 2 million barrels of oil. There's only one arriving entirety of 2024. There's only one ship arriving in the entirety of 2025. And even in 2026, right, folks are seeing this and like, wow, we need to order some ships. And even then, there's only nine in 26. And if you order a ship right now, you can't even get it until 2027. So if you see more ships, maybe you'll get like one or two more here. All of them are going to uh, arrive all the way out here in 2027. This, you can see the history here, and, and we have charts that go all the way back to like 1970. And this is unlike anything in history for tankers. Not only that, uh, Suez Maxes, which are about 1 million barrels of oil, very similar. You have a little bit more in 2025, but you only have nine in 24. And this is the only precedent anything like this is 2014 and 2015 are similar, right? This, this is kind of similar to, to what we see here. And 2016 and 2017 were very strong years for, for tankers. Um, here's the VLCC deliveries by by quarter. And I showed this chart because people say, well, well, Jay, you, you've been talking about this order book for a year and the rates haven't went ballistic yet. Why not, Jay? Well, look, you had 11 ships deliver in, in, in Q1 of this year, six and three. So you've had 20 plus deliveries of VLCCs this year. Now look, look ahead, folks. We have four this quarter. And by the way, of that four, um, one of them just delivered. So we have three left this quarter and then we have zero zero, zero in the next quarters, and we have one in Q4. So you wonder why the low order book's not hitting. Well, hopefully this chart explains it. And then finally, let's talk about the age profile of the fleet. Up here, you can see 29 or 28.3% of the fleet is over 15 years. If you're over 15 years, you cannot get a prime charter with a big oil company like Exxon or Chevron or whatever. And if you're over 20, only the fringiest, sketchiest players will even work with you. And about an eighth of the fleet is, is over 20. And you see the new builds are green, almost nothing. And then everything to the left of about 2009, 2010 is going to be obsolete in the next couple of years. Literally, probably by next year, these, these ships are really obsolete. So look at this massive amount of ships falling off versus just a little bit of new builds replacing them. And the only reason these, these old ships are even still active is because they're getting business from what we call the dark fleet. These are the Russian sanctions. If it wasn't for those sanctions, these ships would have no home in this market. And, and Suez Maxes are similar. Of course, the order book's a little larger, but there's also a lot of older ships here. So a very, very promising market. And then finally, Afro Maxes, which are kind of the third class of, of crude carriers. Also, I just wanted to illustrate the folks, 17% are over 20. 
and then very similar balance. So very old fleet. So hopefully I've beaten that horse enough, how much we love tankers. I think it's amazing. Uh, containers, on the other hand, are in a very tough spot. This is a rough industry. We are cash flow harvesting at this stage. We're investing in companies that have fixed uh, long-term charters, and all they have to do is sit back, relax, and enjoy the cash flows. So our top pick in containers is Denaus Corp, DAC. They just announced this morning. Um, in fact, I, I was setting up these picks last night, and I'm like, I believe they're going to have a good report, but let's hope they don't pork it away. And they did not. They did a great job. They did uh, almost 30 million, about 30 million in repurchases last quarter. They raised their dividend. Um, they are doing phenomenal work. And here's a couple other firms in, in container ships. And of course, I'm long to now score for, for disclosures there. So I'm going to go a little faster and funnier on these next few slides because folks have seen this before. And you can also see this on my YouTube. I want to get to the questions. But the big picture with container ships is that the macro narrative is extremely bearish. But that is already priced 2x, 3x into these stocks. I mean, Denaus Corp should be trading at $110, $120 right now, but it trades at like $63, $64 because everybody is so ridiculously bearish and they haven't actually studied the structure of a lot of these contracts and how strong they are. So that, that's really the takeaway here. If you're like containers is a terrible industry, you're not wrong. I mean, you're correct, but the structure and nuance of some of these charter contracts are very important to understand. So here's the freight rates, and that's why folks are bearish, as they should be, because it was boom and it was bust, and now we're back to where we started. In fact, we're at weaker rates than we were before. So the rates are very they're very weak. We had a boom and bust in freight, and it's been full full cycle. And here's the leasing rates, what, what companies get to lease their ships for one year. You can see it was also kind of boom and bust, but we're actually still above the, the pre-cycle. So the, the leasers, the lessors, the ones that own the ships and lease them to liners like Denaus Corp, actually still doing okay when they're recharting their ships. So it's, it's a little bit stronger of a market for the owners of the actual ships. Uh, last sector I want to talk about is dry bulk. Again, sort of a review from our last session. Uh, it's a recovery play and it's a longer term recovery play. It depends on a couple of things. First of all, it depends on those environmental regulations that, that come online. We'll start biting a little bit next year. It also depends on China stabilizing and recovering. And that's a bet a lot of people don't want to make. So if you're not comfortable with, with a sort of China-leaning bet, um, then dry bulk, you might want to just steer clear of it, to be honest with you. Um, but our top pick in dry bulk is Genco Shipping, GNK. Uh, no personal long position at this point, but I do believe it's a great company. And we have a few other names to mention and, and list there. Uh, a couple of them just reported uh, today or yesterday as well. So there's a lot of trading action uh, going on in dry bulk. Uh, the dry bulk market's been sideways. It's really kind of boring. Uh, there's not a lot to talk about this year. Normally, there's a huge seasonal ramp. You can see here at the end of 19, this is a five-year chart, end of 19, middle of 20, into the end of 21, massive ramp, beautiful ramp into 22, and then, um, or into uh, 21 rather, and then 22 was a stinker. I mean, it was just a bad year. And then 23 is just flat. I mean, it's kind of a boring year. And, and there's obviously more nuance here, but I'm trying to get to the Q&A. But it, long story short, guys, it, it's just kind of boring right now. We're kind of just waiting for the recovery. We're sitting in the dugout. Um, the opening festivities are very belabored. Um, so this is, a, this is a sector where you want to find companies that are trading at large discounts and just buy your time with management teams you can trust. I, I showed the order book with, with crude tankers and with Cape Size. Cape Sizes are the largest class of, of dry bulk carrier. They carry about 200,000 tons of cargo. So think about 200,000 tons and how big a ton is, right, of iron ore, coal, whatever. And, and you can see how large these vessels are. The order book's not as beautiful as it is in tankers, but it's it's pretty nice. 6.2 is, is a pretty small order book. A, nor, a normal order book is like 10 to 15%. And, and you can see the fleet, most of the ships were built like right after. You can imagine these ships were ordered before the crash, right? Before Lehman Brothers and, and the 2008 crash, but they delivered later, right? And so this is kind of the snake uh, digesting the rodent, and we need to push these ships out to the left. So it might have another year or two until that really manifests itself positively. You can see the uh, the fleet profile here. And again, the same sort of snake digesting the rodent. And, and it's kind of stuck here in the middle. Give it a couple years until these yellow ships turn into the red. As long as that order book doesn't balloon, uh, we can have a very, very nice recovery. But it might be, being honest, it might be a year or two away at this point. So review of those top picks. Uh, tankers, I believe, were igniting that super cycle. Uh, Zacos, TNP is our favorite. I'm long that position. Container ships, we really like Denaus Corp, DAC. I'm also along that position. And in dry bulk, our favorite dry bulk play is Genco Shipping, GNK. And of course, at the next money show, probably, I don't know, three, four months from now, I will return here. And, and, and again, the first slide, 
we'll just highlight the performance of those three picks over that time. So thanks everybody. Now I'm, I'm happy to open it up for Q and A. I think we have about six, seven minutes left. Yes. Thank you, Jay. We have a bunch of questions coming in. Our first question is from Andrew, the Panama Canal slowdown. Is that short, short term or is that a bigger problem? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question that for those of you who aren't aware yet, the Panama Canal has a major drought ongoing, or rather Panama has a major drought ongoing. And the Panama Canal expanded in 2016 to use larger size locks to enable larger ships to transit between the continents. And that requires a lot more water. It's the way those locks work is they fill up with water from the lake and then so on and so forth. And eventually a lot of water gets lost. And Panama entered a major drought season about a year and a half ago. They entered into this drought condition, but they didn't really respond by cutting the amount of transits. Well, they let the problem fester and fester and fester, and now they're in emergency state. And they just announced they have to cut some of their transits, the larger locks, by up to 50% capacity. That's having a huge impact on the LPG trade. And I didn't talk about LPG today, but it's another sector. Um, it's having a minor impact on dry bulk. We're seeing a lot of dry bulk cargoes rerouted away from the Panama Canal and over to Africa to go through the Suez Canal, right? The cargoes that are going from west to east. So either way, they're still using a canal, but we're talking about 50 to 60% addition to the ton miles. And as I mentioned earlier, larger ton miles is bullish for shipping. So I think the original question wasn't so much like what it is, but I'm just trying to explain to other folks. And the question was whether or not this was bullish and whether or not it was long-term. It's absolutely bullish. In terms of the duration, I believe it's probably going to be at least three to six months of impact. I don't know about the longer, longer term. I, that's more of a meteorologist question. Um, but I do question the uh, thought process of expanding that they did in 2016. I, obviously, they didn't do the proper environmental due diligence on that one. So I, I think it's going to linger. And I, and I think the policymakers are going to have to take this more into better consideration going forward. And if they want to recover that lake to not just baseline levels, but actually healthy levels, then this could be something we're talking about for at least another year. Great. Um before I give you the next question, we had somebody ask if you could repeat the tanker symbols. Maybe you could put that slide back up. Oh, you know what? I'll just put, uh, go backwards here. Yeah, I'll just do the top picks as I talk. You know, you, I'll get the point here. We'll just do, oh, sorry for this. It's going to everyone's eyes. Uh, there we go. There's the three picks and I'll take the next question. Okay, very good. Craig is saying there's a major coal export yard in Baltimore. And for the first time in many years, they've been full of coal. How is the coal shipping market doing? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm happy to see, well, I, I don't know. I don't know how many ESG folks we got on the call, but I, but I am happy to see the U.S. is, is back and, and exporting coal. I mean, the U.S. has a great source of coal, especially uh, some of the Western coal is, is actually quite environmental friendly, the low, uh, the low sulfur uh, variants of that. Um, in, in terms of the U.S. impact to the coal market, quite frankly, it, it's, it's uh, a rounding error. Uh, we're talking like one or 2% max uh, impact to the to global coal markets. Global coal markets, the pricing has in increased uh, a lot over the last couple of years. The, some of the firms that have mines in Australia are, are doing quite well. Um, Australia had a, we kind of called it a coal war with China. There was some sanctions that China put against Australia from 2020 to 2022. Uh, those have been lifted now. And, and so some of these Australian uh, miners are doing quite well exporting their coal all over. Um, that's a dry bulk play, right? So coal is one of the major cargoes of dry bulk. The, the main one's iron ore, the next one is coal. And then you have some of the, the grains and agricultures. And then you have minor bulks, um, some of the smaller things like uh, wood chips and things like that. So uh, I would say the coal markets are decent, slightly healthy. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that the U.S. Is, is exporting some of their capacity again, but but it's just a small part of the market. And I, I don't think that's going to move the needle for us. Okay, Steen is saying Frontline has changed the depreciation of their vessels from 25% to 20%. Will other companies follow that, and how will that play out for future valuations? Yeah, so I'm guessing uh, he means 20 years to uh, 25 years to 20 years, which which makes sense. I, I think when a lot of companies came public, um, a lot of them, a lot of these older companies came public in like 2006, 2007, when everybody was desperate to kind of jump on the China growth train. And they would use these depreciation schedules that were misleading and unrealistic. And so a 25-year depreciation cycle, I just talked about it right earlier in the charts. I said most of these tankers are good for about 15 years of prime business, about 20, 21 years of overall business. And so I think the shift to 20 is just the right call. And to be clear, uh, Euronav already does that. Uh, DHT already does something similar. 
Um, I think all tanker companies should use a 20 year profile. I've always advocated for that. Um, that's why I don't focus on earnings EPS because that stuff can be manipulated by accounting things like depreciation. Um, I focus on both operating cash flow and free cash flow. And I think those are far better metrics of, of shipping performance. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. VG is asking, which sector out do, outlook do you favor more, dirty versus clean, or are you indifferent to both? I, I, that's a great question. Uh, last summer, I last summer I, I was I was leaning towards dirty because the order book is just beautiful, and I, I showed the charts on on VLCCs. I still think the dirty order book. <laughs> it's funny when you say it like that. I, I still think that one is is the far more positive one. However, I think the demand fundamentals on the clean side of the trade, so things like diesel, gasoline, jet fuel, are actually stronger. And I also look at the companies. It's all about valuations. So last summer, it, it was pretty obvious when crew tankers traded even cheaper than product tankers. But now you have companies like Scorpio Tankers, which I'm long, which is one of my favorites. They trade at like a 30% discount to NAV, where some of the crew tankers are at a 10% premium. So do you want to pay 110% of this sector or 70% for this segment? And so right now, when I factor the valuations in, um, I would say product. But if you're just asking me, you like like overall market strength, I like crude. But if I can get something for 70% versus 110, um, I'm going to go with product. Okay, very good. That does conclude the time for this session. I appreciate you, Jay, and all your insight. And thank you all for joining us. And please stay tuned as we have other great presentations coming up ahead. Thank, thank you, you, Jay. Everybody.